Pastor Stan and Karen are on a missionary assignment. They'll be back this week. And uh, I'm honored to be able to step into uh, this role today and continue this uh, brilliant conversation that Pastor Stan started last week, the Holy Spirit and you. The Holy Spirit and you. This is not a theological um, uh, class, per se. It may help us in that, but it's not just a lecture this morning. This isn't just a, uh, a speech that I'm giving uh, or just a talk, but I'm, I'm conversing with you and sharing with you a very important truth. Pastor Stan set the stage last week by looking at the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, and my takeaway was that uh, God was not only creator, but he, he, uh, we discovered that in the creation that the Holy Spirit comes and brings order to chaos. And some of you have lived in chaos a long time. I'm here to tell you that the Holy Spirit really helps. He brings order to our chaos. I'm going to speak to you about the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. So we're going to fast forward from the Old Testament now to the New Testament. There was a, a Christian school where the teacher began every class uh, in his Bible class by helping the students in the class understand foundational truths. And he had various assigned students quote at the beginning of each class portions of what is known as the Apostles' Creed. I'm not going to get into all of the Apostles' Creed, but these statements of faith w would instill in the students what they believe and why they believe it. And so it was called the Apostles' Creed. It would begin like this, and one student who was assigned to the, be the first one would stand in the class, and he would make this statement. I believe in God Almighty, he would say, creator of heaven and earth, and so on. And then he would sit down. And the next student would be a young lady who would stand, and she would quote, I believe in Jesus Christ, his son, our Lord, and so on. And then she sat down on this particular day. And then the room grew silent. And everybody became uncomfortable in the silence. What was next? Finally, somebody from the back said, the boy who believes in the Holy Spirit is not here today. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you that the boy who believes in the Holy Spirit is here this morning. And I want to talk to you about the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. And I want to draw your attention to a very important passage. I'm going to read from John chapter 16. It might surprise you that the Gospel of John, about half, maybe a little more than that, deals with the last week of Jesus' life. John chapter 13 is that famous chapter that describes when Jesus washed the, sheet, the feet of the, the, the disciples. And uh, that was quite an expression of deep, compassionate love. And in chapter 14, he addresses the work of the Holy Spirit, introduces what is going to happen. Chapter 15, they leave the upper room where they had gathered, and they're walking through a vineyard. And this is where Jesus talks about, I am the vine and you are the branches. And he illustrates, as he did often, a truth by giving a visual. So visual learners like myself, this would have been fantastic. I would have gotten this. I would have understood it. We come to chapter 16, and Jesus now is walking with the disciples, and he's talking to them about the future. In the just a few days, I'm going to be leaving you. Chapter 17 is where they go to the Garden of Gethsemane, and that's the great high priestly prayer that we refer to, where Jesus gets down on his knees, and he prays for the world, he prays for the disciples, and he prays for you and me. And maybe someday we'll come through that passage and talk about it. But I want to go back to chapter 16 because it's here where we have the most emphatic and clear description in the New Testament of the Holy Spirit's work. And Jesus is helping the disciples understand what's about to happen. So I'm going to pick it up at verse number 5, John chapter 16. I'm reading from the New International Version. There's many versions of this that are easy to understand. This one seems to fit best for today. But now I am going to him. Jesus is saying to the disciples, I'm going to go to him, speaking of God the Father, who sent me. None of you asked me, where are you going? 
like the disciples are not quite sure this all computes for them yet. And they're, they haven't even asked the question, like, where are you going? They perhaps think he's just going to go out into a solitary place and pray like he had done before. Verse 6 says, rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. Verse 7, but very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away unless I go away, the advocate, everybody say advocate. I'll come back to that in a moment to help us understand what he's saying will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Now I'm going to just move forward quickly. I want to add verse 12. It's not on the screen here, but Jesus continues. I have said much more. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. In other words, I could tell you a lot more but you couldn't bear it all. So I'm going to just tell you this, verse 13. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. When you read the New Testament, you'll see, number one, the announcement of the Holy Spirit. And you see the prominence of the Holy Spirit working throughout the New Testament. Just think for a moment. In a, in a few weeks, we're going to be celebrating uh, the birth of Jesus Christ. And that miraculous birth of Jesus Christ begins with the work of the Holy Spirit. So you follow that storyline all through the New Testament, and you see the baptism of John, you see uh, a variety of works. Jesus is led by the Spirit, and you see uh, miraculous things take place by the Spirit of God. We come to the book of Acts, and we'll look at this in the future, uh, and that is when the church is birthed by the Holy Spirit. And then all through the, the New Testament, you now, oh wow, I see the Holy Spirit. In fact, if you read through the Bible, the Old Testament, which Pastor Stan talked about last week, uh, has many references to the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. In the New Testament, you'll find about 250 specific references to the Holy Spirit. And that's about 150 more times than you read in the Old Testament. And there is a reason for that. The prominence of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament it should be a great comfort to all of us and helps us understand what we're working through today. Because the Holy Spirit will help you determine whether you're going to be a, a victim in life or a victor in life, right? Whether, and a lot of us, perhaps, some of you here, maybe there's some here right today, this has not been the best week of your life. And in fact, maybe the not, it's not been the best year of your life. And in some ways, you feel like you're a victim. And there is a, a culture that we have created in America uh, being victims. But God doesn't want us to live that way. He wants us to live as victors. Amen? He wants you to live on the victory side. He doesn't want you to live in weakness where you feel like I'm failing every week. I'm going to come to church and I'm going to confess my sin and I hope I make it another week until I can confess my sin again. He wants you to live in strength and victory. And the only possible way that can be, Jesus is saying to his disciples and saying to us this morning, is the work of the Holy Spirit. Now it's important to understand, I'd like to just reemphasize something that was shared last week is we believe in the triune God, often referred to as the Trinity. It's one of those mysteries sometimes that we can't fully understand. And theologians have debated about how to explain this, perhaps. But let me just remind you of this, and will help you understand how this it probably lays out best. God the Father is the divine designer. And he is emphasized in the Old Testament as the creator. And in fact, when you think of God the Father, you go to the Old Testament and you discover his true character, his compassion, the way he works amongst men and women and, and humanity. And you can see that. And oftentimes when I'm kind of like, you know, can God take care of this? I read the Old Testament. I see that God's at work and certainly he does. In the New Testament, we see the emphasis of God the Son. He is the sinless Savior. He's emphasized in the New Testament from the Gospels into the early church as the Christ, the anointed one, the one who came as a man and took on the form of man to he could actually die for our sins. And you see that emphasized in the Gospel into the, through the New Testament. 
Then we have the third member of the Godhead. And that's the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit. He is the active agent, even today. He emphasize, he's emphasized in the church age, which we're in even now. He's the comforter, as the scripture says. They work in complete unity. And you say, I have a tough time understanding the Trinity and how three persons could be one. It's one person with three persons, the Trinity. And you know, you're a tripart being. Maybe you've never thought about this before. There's the physical part of you that people see and they say, hey, there's, there's Bill, there's, there's Jim, there's Pastor David. Uh, we physically uh, represent ourselves, but we also have a soul, a soul. And maybe in a non-theological term, you could say that is uh, our personality, but it is made up of your heart, your mind, your will, your uh, conscience, and your emotions. And that is the person inside this body. And then there's a third part of you that maybe you've never thought about, but that's your spirit. So just look at the person next to you for a moment. There's a tripart being. Hopefully they have a spirit, because if they don't have a spirit, they're dead. Okay? And the spirit is that portion that is connected, like, like that antenna in your life, that, that, that uh, connection with God himself. He breathed into us. We became living souls. And we uh, sets us apart from any other creation. So you're a tripart being. That may help. I know there's other perhaps elementary forms of explaining the Trinity, but I want you to understand that we live in a time when the active agent, the Holy Spirit is working and he's not limited to a physical body. He's here at work on, and he is God as we can see here. So Jesus is talking about this active agent. He's describing to the disciples and for us this morning, the Holy Spirit's work and what he's going to do. And he tells them that he is going to leave them. He physically is going to leave them. Look at verse 6 again as we read. You are filled with grief because I have said these things. Uh, the, Jesus is saying something and they are staggering by this statement. They are taken back by this statement. That even his disciples weren't quite sure what does this mean. Look at verse number 7. It is good for you. It is good for you that I am going away. Jesus is telling them the truth. In order for you to live victoriously and fulfill the Great Commission, in order for you to be a victorious believer, you're going to need the Holy Spirit to help you. This is good for you. I, I don't know if you grew up in a home where your, your parents perhaps told you things and said, this is good for you, and everything within you said, I don't care, I don't like it. Well, I grew up in a home where we could not leave the table without eating all the vegetables that had been served. Anybody else have that kind of experience? My parents, my mom came from a, a family of 10 children. My dad came from a family of six children. They came through the Great Depression. They came right into World War II. Money was tight. Resources were limited. Do you know that even in the car business, they didn't produce cars during World, World War II for a, a few years. It was hard, my dad said, to even find tires for your car. There were lots of things, food, uh, jobs, uh, income. And they, they, so they, they grew up in that. That meant that we ate everything that was on the table before us. We never said we didn't like it. So I remember sitting there many times and my mom pull out the canned asparagus. She pulled out uh, canned this and canned that. And she said, we're going to eat this tonight and we're going to enjoy it, Billy. And she said, you know, someday you will like this and it'll be good for you now. It'll help you to grow up and be a strong man. And I used to say, I don't like it. When my dad, we, we would say, corrected us, in those days we said punished us, uh, when we got out of hand or said something wrong or did something uh, disrespectful, uh, we had a belt in our closet in the laundry room that said, I need thee every hour. So I, uh, I was faced with that, and my dad would often say when he would discipline me, by the way, he's watching the, today, he's 95 years old, he lives in sunny California, taking in the rays today for sure, but he's watching me today, and hi, Dad, love you. Thank you for disciplining me. 
And he, he would say, I'm doing this for your good. And I'd say, I'd like to show you some good to you as well, but uh, <laughs> it didn't work out so well. Jesus says to his disciples, I'm going to go away. And it's for your good. He's giving them the announcement of the Holy Spirit. He's speaking to them. He says in verse 7, unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Now, the word advocate in the Greek is paraclete. And I just bring that up not to impress you, but to just help you understand what this actually means. And it means one who's called alongside to provide, to provide assistance. So he's saying that the Holy Spirit will come alongside you because the assignment I give you, life itself, you're going to need help, right? How many of you are married and know you need help? How many of you are parented? He's raising his hand all the way up. Did you notice that? How many of you are parents? How many of you are in school? How many of you teach? How many of you work with people that just irritate you? You need help to even like them. You need help to like your neighbor who won't cut that tree down that's just dripping all of the, the needles all over your yard. You need help. We need help. He said, I'm going to give you an assignment for life, and you're going to need help to do it. That's the Holy Spirit, he says. The paraclete, the one who, who comforts us, who is our helper, one version says. One who is our supporter, another version says. This is the work of the Holy Spirit today in the church. Now, there's another English word that's very close to it, and it's paramedic. And it's interesting because a paramedic, when we think of a paramedic, we think of somebody who comes to assist us medically in time of need. Uh, there is a, a great need I read in the, the newspaper or the online uh, paper that I read this week that Portland is saying we need more paramedics because there is great need, and they come along medically. So take those two words and you see the connection is the Holy Spirit's purpose, Jesus is announcing, is he's going to be your advocate. He's going to come alongside you and assist you and provide assistance to you. Verse 16, uh, verse 13 is the key verse today. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will, listen to, guide you into all truth. Now I want you to notice something about this text. I talk with people, you perhaps have felt this as well. Oftentimes we refer to the Holy Spirit as an it, or a force, or a feeling. If they play the right song at church, I feel the Holy Spirit. And I'm not suggesting that you don't have feelings, because that's part of our senses. But the Holy Spirit is not an it or a force. It's a he, it's mentioned, a personal pronoun, Jesus says he, because he's part of the Godhead. He's not like some religious Groups teach the Holy Spirit is just kind of a, a force out there. He is a present person at work in our lives. And Jesus underscores that, which is very, very important. Because Jesus knew the disciples really well. He's given this massive assignment to go into all the world and preach the gospel. He knows that they need the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm here to tell you that in order for me to be a man of God, a Christian, a believer... In order for me to be a husband to my wife, in order to be a, a, a parent to my children, and my, a grandparent to my grandchildren, in order for me to be a pastor, in order for me to fulfill the assignment and calling on my life, I'm just going to tell you right now, I need the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus knew that. That's why he said in the New Testament, you see it over and over again, the emphasis of the Holy Spirit at work, because in order for us to be Christians today truly have any spiritual experience at all, you need the Holy Spirit. In fact, anything that's ever happened to you in your spirit as far as being a believer has been done by the work of the Holy Spirit today. And that's what the scripture teaches. And Jesus is in making this wonderful announcement. A number of years ago, I was, um, I was kind of mentored, I think. I tr was trained to believe that I should begin to pray that God would draw people to the church I was serving. And I began to make this my practice. And I would say, Lord, compel them. We spent a lot of money on that big LED sign. We uh, had all kinds of promotional pieces that went out into the community. But Lord, draw people in. I used to pray this way. 
Bring them in from the north, bring them in from the south, bring them in from the west and the east. And if I was pointing the wrong direction, the Lord understood what I was meaning, right? So, and in fact, sometimes in prayer times, we would, I would have the whole church just face these different directions, and we would compel people to come. And sometimes the Lord would download a specific person we should be praying for and ask them to come. So that's the way we begin to pray. And I'd like to challenge all of us to do the same thing. Uh, pray that when people drive by on Norwood as it's beginning to change from that little country road to now a massive uh, street with lots of houses, that people when they see uh, Horizon Community Church would say in their spirit, I think I need to go there. When people drive uh, up or down uh, Boone's Ferry, out here, Southwest Boone's Ferry, that they would see the campus and they'd feel, I need to go there. When people, think of the millions of people who drive up and down I-5 in the course of uh, uh, a month, and they see the houses going up, they see the water towers, aren't those beautiful water towers? They're just so gorgeous, I can't wait till they hide them with the other paint. And then they look and there's this huge building, and they say to themselves, I wonder what that building is. And then they feel it's compelling to go into that building. So there was a guy by the name of Bob the Businessman. That's what we'll just call him, Bob the Businessman. Very successful, young, 20-something guy who was in business with his dad. They built this huge business, and it was uh, well-respected in the industry. And uh, their business was on the southeast side of Portland, and they... He got a call, Bob got a call from a, a person in Southwest Hills of Portland saying, hey, listen, I'd like you to come and give me a bid on my property. I'm doing some remodeling and I need your work. And Bob said, ah, I'm not, not really interested. We're busy. And the guy kept calling. So finally, Bob said, okay, I'll come over to your place. I'll look over the job. I'll write you a bid and give it to you. Well, so Bob went over to the west side he, didn't, he wasn't all that comfortable in crossing the Willamette River. Found out that real people live on the west side of Portland as well. And he drove up into the hills, went to this property. He looked over the deal, and he gave him a bid. But he gave him a real high bid, extremely high, because he didn't want the job. But he was doing it out of courtesy. So he wrote high bid, went back to his office, thought that's the end of that. And a couple of days later, the guy called, and he said... <laughs> He said, uh, you got the bid. Bob wasn't all that happy about the bid and about the job, but he reluctantly honored his word. Now, Bob had never been to church in his life except for two reasons. Once he went to a funeral of a friend, and once he went to a wedding of a friend, all right? And so he uh, never been to church and grew up in that kind of family, and he drives past our church building every day for 13 days. And the first day he went by, he noticed the sign and had this kind of funny feeling like he should go there sometime. And uh, he thought it was just a silly thought. Uh, he knew all the clubs, by the way, in Portland. He, that's where he frequented those clubs. He knew all of those, but he'd never been to church. So over the course of these 13 days, every time he drove by to this job he did not want, he reluctantly had this sense I should go into that building. Bob did not know, Bob did not know that there was a pastor praying that when people drove by, they would sense a feeling of coming in. So finally into the second week, Bob felt a strong urge to come into the building, and he thought he could satisfy the urge if he drove and parked in the parking lot. And he felt like if I go in and park in the parking lot for a few minutes, and then I can take off and I'll say, well, I did my thing and I feel relieved. So he pulled into the parking lot. He sat in his car all alone. And what happened next, he will never forget. And what happened next, I will never forget. And I don't want you to forget these words. But when he, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you to all truth. Now think about that for a moment. I, I want to know what I'm supposed to do how I'm supposed to respond, what does the Bible mean, he will guide you into all truth. So not only do you have this wonderful announcement, now I want to just point out to you, for there are many, I could 
shoot for. But Joy's here this morning, and she only allows me to speak for so long. So uh, she is here. She'll close her Bible when it's over. I didn't see her in the last service, so I went really long, but I'm going to speed it up today. But we come to the activity of the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to just point out four, okay? Everybody say four. If I add a fifth, you're welcome to get up and leave. All right? So number four. No, let's go to number one first. But he, when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. Nothing, I want to underscore this again, happens in your life spiritually without the work of the Holy Spirit. I don't care what your background is, whether you never even heard of the Holy Spirit. I talked to a good friend of mine who went to church all his life. He said, I never heard anything said about the Holy Spirit. Well, the boy that believes in the Holy Spirit's here, so he will say, First of all, thing I see in the New Testament is that we need to understand that the Holy Spirit is active in bringing conviction. Conviction. I didn't say condemnation, but conviction. My first reaction to the word conviction is kind of negative, I suppose, but really, it's not a negative word. It's a wonderful word. The Holy Spirit alerts us to behaviors that are destroying our life. The Holy Spirit helps us understand that there are sinful tendencies or actions in our life that are separating us from God. Thank the Lord for conviction. Things like the sin of selfishness. I am grateful that the Lord convicts me of selfishness. Anger or lust or arrogance or uh, disobedience. And on and on the list can go. Things, even in a service like this, I'm grateful that the Holy Spirit gets my attention and says that is not good for you. It's not producing life in your life. It is destroying your life. It's taking you from being a victor to a victim. This is the work that I noticed in the work of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 16 and verse 8, we read it earlier, but here it is. And when he comes, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of its sin. In other words, he will turn the light on and will realize that we're going the wrong direction. We're doing things contrary to what God had in store for us. There are a lot of people in the world today, perhaps you, you can sense this. Their lives are a mess. If that wasn't God's intent, he sends conviction for the purpose of bringing correction to our lives, which should lead us to repentance, where we say, Lord, forgive me, conviction. Conviction also helps us create some barriers or lines in our lives or borders that says, I'm not stepping outside of that. I know what that will do. That's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It's like you have a strong belief about something. I can probably argue with someone who has a different opinion, but if somebody has a conviction, I'm not really in a position to try to change that conviction. But the conviction of the Holy Spirit, look at what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 5. He says, our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. There's that word once again. You know, Joy drives this car. It's got... Uh, I'm not quite sure I figured it all out. There's a lot of electronics on it, but... She has, I think she has done this. She sets the speedometer uh, alert that if I exceed the speed limit, it buzzes. <laughs> so I'll be driving along, minding my own business, saying, hey, I need to go faster. Everybody else is driving faster. And then all of a sudden, ding, 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 ding. And I realize, joy bells, she's not with me, but she's got this thing set. And that's what the Holy Spirit does, Right? Have you ever had that experience where you're starting to make a decision or do something and the Holy Spirit says, wait, 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 Bill, that's not the right direction. That's going to offend. Now, Joy's doing this for my good, right? Yeah. <laughs> All the wives said yes and the men are saying, I don't know, I'm still thinking about it. <laughs> the Holy Spirit brings conviction for our good, not to condemn us but to keep us from going to hell, keep from messing up our lives. There's somebody here today who's thought about, well, you know, I'm just going to call this thing quits. I'm stepping away from it all. And if you listen to the Holy Spirit, he'll say, wait, 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 wait. That's the wrong decision. 
That's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. We can thank God for the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Here's, here's a second thought. That, that uh, when you read through the New Testament, you see that the Holy Spirit brings change. Another word might be transformation. Not only conviction, but he actually brings change. And Paul writes about this in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13. He says, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. You don't have to raise your hand on this, but a lot of us never thought about pleasing God. We're only about pleasing ourselves. But the Holy Spirit comes and he starts to bring change into our lives. Things that will, will change our lives. Our, our, the, the things that we used to be afraid of, he changes that. The hesitation of maybe speaking up, he changes that. The sinful pattern of habits, he changes that. He, he brings transformation. The way we use our time, he changes that. The, the, the reluctance, he changes that. He transforms us. And nothing has been more fulfilling in my life as a leader over these last 50 some years than to see people's lives changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. To see people who once were lost and consumed with all kinds of, of uh, destructive behaviors set free by the power of the Holy Spirit and their lives are literally changed. Their lives are changed. When I was in high school, I played uh, an offensive uh, end position in our high school team. My junior year, we went to uh, state championship, won our league division. I even got a trophy. Nobody else wants it, but I still have it in my office to remind me of the success of that football season. And I, I was next to a tackle by the name of Steve. He's a big guy, much bigger than me. And uh, his, his responsibility was to protect the quarterback or push out the opponent so the, the runner could get through on a, on a, a, a carry. And um, his mouth was terrible. I mean, it was terrible. I don't have to go through all the words. You can imagine the things that came out of his mouth when he got hit hard or when there was a disagreement with the other team or, you know, it was just terrible. It was around language that we didn't talk a, like at church or in our home. In fact, if I ever used some of those words, my parents would ground me for three years, take away everything, and wash my mouth out with soap and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it was terrible language. I once said to Steve during the football season, hey, Steve, would you like to go to our church? He said, oh, I've never been to church before, so I guess I'd go with you. I heard you had good-looking girls at your church, so I guess that's a good reason. I never thought much about the good-looking girls, but he thought they were good-looking. In fact, he married one of them. So he, he came to our church, and you know what happened? He gave his heart to the Lord. Steve, big Steve, who used all kinds of foul language as his normal way of communication, football player Steve, first Christian in his family, gave his heart to Jesus. So then I thought, well, I'm the pastor's son. I probably should take him aside and say, hey, listen, if you're going to our church, you don't talk like that on the football field. And I still remember I started to say something and the Lord said, no, that's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is just to love Steve and care for him. If he asks you for advice, fine. But you don't go around telling him all the things he's got to do now. So I said, okay. And you know what Steve started doing? Same thing you should do. Same thing I should do. He read his Bible every day and he prayed longer than I prayed. And I noticed, not overnight, but slowly, we'd line up on the line and something was going on, that Steve's language changed. He wasn't using those words anymore. I never talked to him about it. The Holy Spirit brought transformation. His old patterns, his old habits. He started going to church every time the doors opened. He started volunteering. He loved the Lord. We one summer worked together. He never used foul language one time, and there was plenty of reasons to use it in the job we had. He never used it one time. And all I could say is it was before my eyes, the transformation of my friend Steve, who came to know the Lord. I saw him a few years ago at a reunion, and I said, Steve, one thing I remember about you is when Jesus came into your life, he changed the way you talked. 
and tears welled up in his eyes. And he remembered that moment as well. One thing I've read, read when I come through the New Testament, I see how the Holy Spirit brings change. But not only does he bring conviction and bring change, but he brings clarity. He brings clarity. Look at the verse again. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. So we live in a very confused culture, right? People are not sure what their identity is. There are uh, lots of confusions about liberties and life and so on. A friend of mine wrote the book, Transformation. Transformation. It's Linda, brilliant PhD, who at the age of 13, as a young woman, thought she should be a man. And she tells her personal story. But at the age of 17, she had an encounter with Jesus Christ who brought clarity to who she really was. Coming from an abused background, and if you ever want to read a great book with lots of information and you struggle in this area or you have family members, Transformation, great book to read. Linda shares her personal story of how the Holy Spirit changed her life and brought clarity to her decisions. Perhaps you're here today and say, I wonder what I'm supposed to do. Jesus earlier in John chapter 14, when he's still in the upper room, says this, he, the Holy Spirit, who leads into all truth, he reinforces that later on. He goes on in verse 26, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things, will remind you of everything I have said to you. The New Testament teaches us that the Holy Spirit brings conviction. The Holy Spirit brings to you change, and the Holy Spirit will bring you clarity. I just feel like I need to say this right now. I'm going to just take a moment. There's someone here today, maybe more than one person, who feels somewhat confused about what's the next step. I want to encourage you to remember that the Holy Spirit brings clarity to situations. Let him lead you. That's why Jesus said, I'm sending him to you. And the final thing I would say is the Holy Spirit brings comfort. Comfort. He says in, uh, the Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1, 3. I've, I've loved this verse for many, many years. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. Now, the comfort of the Holy Spirit isn't just to wipe away tears when you go through a real hard time. When you lost a loved one or you've lost your job or you've... You've gone through a painful moment, and you're just night and day sitting with my dear friend who went through a, a divorce. And I remember he, we, Joy and I said, hey, come and live with us for a while. I'll tell you. And so we opened up our home. We only had three bedrooms, and we had three kids. So we had to kind of make some adjustments and all. But every night about 11 o'clock at night, he would just weep and weep and weep. The comfort of the Holy Spirit helps us in those moments. But this is not only about comfort in our sorrows, but it's speaking of strength right now. Strength in whatever is our challenge. It's like, it's like being on the sidelines. The coach saying, stay with it. Don't give up. Don't quit. Keep going. You can make it. The Holy Spirit many times has, has overwhelmed me with those moments when I'm in the midst of seeing a dream die. I had this dream. I thought it was from the Lord. And it was from the Lord, but I was going through the valley of the shadow of death. And the Holy Spirit, the Bible says in the New Testament, comes to comfort us and say, don't give up yet. And I'm saying to you this morning that God is going to help in every situation. Keep going. Joy has an accountability friend. Her name's Vicki. They've been friends for, oh, 34 years. They talk to each other. They pray with each other. They share each other's burdens and each other's joys. And Vicki was telling us one time that many years ago, she and her young son, Jason, were on a plane. And they, they I like the words that airlines use these days, uh, turbulence or rough air. I mean, it's an all out shaking. You think this is it, we're going down. It's not just rough air, it's horrific air. You've been on that flight lately? And something 
welled up in Vicky's heart. And her little boy said, what are you doing, Mom? She unbuckled her seatbelt. She stood up in the second row of the plane. She turned towards all the passengers as the plane is shaking and people are screaming. And she throws up her hands and says, do not be afraid. God is with us. And everybody came to a complete silence. Who is this crazy woman on the front? She said, I said, do not be afraid. God is with us. Then she sat down, buckled up her seatbelt, and her son looked at her like, are you crazy? (laughs) And I'm here to tell you, do not be afraid. The Holy Spirit is with us. In the turbulence and the rough airs and the rough roads and the struggles of life, he comes to bring comfort. When he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. Bob, the businessman, sat in his car thinking that if I sit in the parking lot for a few minutes, this feeling of drawing will go away. You know what happened? It got more intense. He could not shake it. He finally said, okay, I'm going to go next Sunday. I've never been to church, but I'm going to go next Sunday, and I'm going to go inside. So he drove up. He wasn't sure how to dress. Wasn't sure what would happen when he walked through the doors. Fortunately, fortunately, the people at the door smiled and welcomed him. Fortunately, when he came in, he sat on the left-hand side towards the back. He sat next to a really nice guy who entered into the service, wasn't just a spectator, and made him feel welcomed. He'd never been to church. He sat there. He didn't know why people stood when they sang. Some people were raising their hands. Some people were more vocal than others. He stood there stunned by what he had imagined church might be and had this overwhelming sense that this is what I need in my life. Here's a successful business guy who knew all the clubs in Portland and was very wealthy, never borrowed one dime, paid cash for everything, drove two new cars even though he needed one, had this wonderful business, great reputation. When I came up to the platform, the pulpit, the up front here, to, to talk about the offering, he said, oh yeah, I knew. All you guys want is my money. But he couldn't take himself out of the building. And I spoke and, and you know, I don't know what I preached on. Isn't that amazing? But I spoke on something. And at the end of the prayer, at the end of the sermon, I did a prayer like I'm going to do just in a moment. And Bob prayed that prayer for the first time in his life. And it absolutely radically changed this guy's life. He experienced the power of the Holy Spirit who brought conviction into his life, who brought immediate changes, clarity, and comfort. Gave his heart to the Lord. Met a beautiful young lady. They got married. Had two fine young men. In fact, both of those boys went to high school right here at Horizon. One of them played basketball right here on this court. They went on to graduate, one from Oregon State, one from Northwest University. I met for coffee with a young man from Oregon State this last week. Wonderful Christian guy, about the same age as his dad was when he drove into that parking lot. What brought him there? He didn't know anything except the Spirit of God was at work. See, this is when we pray, ladies and gentlemen. We pray for our neighbors. We pray for our kids. We pray for that guy that works with us that we don't really like that much, but we're praying for him. And they drive by and they sense the compelling. It's not because we're all that great. It's the power of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament and in today. Father, thank you. Thank you for Bob's story and thank you for our story. I pray. Would you stand with me? And if you this morning would close your eyes for a moment and if you feel like today, I sense the Holy Spirit drawing me, Pastor Bill. 
I feel like I need to give my life fully to the Lord. With your heads bowed, your eyes closed for a moment, would you just lift your hand and say, that's me. I'm giving it all to the Lord today. That's me. I'm not going to fight it any longer. That's the Holy Spirit. Would you all pray this prayer with me and those who are saying the same prayer in their hearts, those of you who have responded? Dear Heavenly Father, I surrender my life to you. From this day forward, I will follow you. Cleanse me from all my sin and make me the person you want me to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. If you all take your hands just like this, just say, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to be that person that is full of the Holy Spirit. I pray this in Jesus' name.